Good evening. I am absolutely delighted to welcome you to this first major Women for Change event. My name is Garance and I would like to take just two minutes of your time before I hand over to a wonderful guest to answer the question, why are we all here tonight? Well, if you're here, you might know that at Change Now, our job is to find promising innovative solutions to the world's biggest challenges, solutions that are changing or will change eventually the world, but do not receive the recognition, the visibility and the funding they deserve. Then, when we find it, we do our very best to drive all the resources they need to them so that they can grow and have a bigger impact. In a nutshell, that's our job. And as you can tell, what we are trying to solve here, the lack of visibility, of recognition, is all the more true when these solutions are led by women. What a world we live in, right? These women entrepreneurs, innovators, artists, activists are not celebrated enough, or at least not enough for a taste. And right there, this is the very reason for the creation of this Women for Change initiative. We thought it was our duty as a company whose mission is to find those same solutions that are changing the world to speak out on those issues. We want to give a room to those women who say no, who challenge the current systems. Those women and girls who are angry and have the rage to change the world. Because yes, it takes some rage to change the world. Those women who are not afraid of the dangers, of the judgments and of the society as it is. The same society that we need to change. They have a vision. A vision of a more conscious, a more inclusive, and a more sustainable world. So tonight, we will listen. We're going to listen to these women I speak of, but also to those men who have chosen the path of equality. And not just by talking, by doing. Now, and more than ever, we understood that actions had better be more than just words. So to all of you listening tonight, I would like to say this Women for Change event is just the beginning of a long adventure of inspiration, admiration and action. And to all the women and girls listening right now, hear me out. No matter who you are, no matter what your age, your story, or your background, we will make sure that you have a room to speak, to stand up for yourself, and to receive the visibility, the recognition, and the opportunities that you deserve. I wish you all a lovely evening with our incredible speakers that will definitely shape the next decade. And there are many, many more to come, so stay tuned. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Celine, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, I'm delighted to be here. It's a privilege for me. I am Céline Dassonville. I'm working as Vice President of UN Women France, and we are currently launching the e 4 c French Coalitions. Today, I will have discussions with two women that are driving the change and that, I, uh, that are inspiring us. We're gonna try to tackle the issue of understanding why women are powerful agents of change. To do that, we will look first at research and look at the different things that we need to take um, into consideration when we want to design program initiative that will be empowering women. And I will as well exchange with um, um, Winji on how a program can be designed to give birth to women that will have a strong impact to change the world. So first, let me introduce um, you to um, Zoe, which is uh, joining us from Singapore. It's quite late, it's about midnight. So Zoe, could you tell us a few words about you on the field of research that you are conducting so far for the INSEAD? Thank you, Celine. 
I am delighted to be able to share with you that INSEAD's gender initiative research is clear about how social support for people in general and for women in particular leads to more support for women and women's empowerment. Women who receive more social support are more engaged with their work, have higher levels of workplace well-being, and do more to support other women. And receiving social support also motivates everyone to do more to, be to benefit society, to create and contribute to environmental and diversity initiatives, to contribute to economic development and community building, and even serving on nonprofit boards. Oh, that's very interesting. So could you sh tell us a bit more about the key findings of your research on how this su social support is implemented and what um, are the key secrets maybe that we are unconscious about that you could awake us to? Yes, so when I say receiving social support, sometimes people think I just mean emotional support having a shoulder to cry on, hearing everything will be okay, this sort of thing. And social support does include this, but it is also so much more. It is about getting information, learning knowledge of how to do things and how to access resources, and getting practical help that people need to get things done. This includes having a, a good, strong, robust network to help open doors. So network is the key things to have when you want to empower women to drive the change. Um, and apparently the social field, by social field women, women working on impact type of project is something that are women are more um, um, empowered to tackle as a leader. You shared with me a few insights when we discussed, and you told me one thing that was very interesting about the research that you made. It's that when we look at um, social support, when we look at uh, working to impact the world, women have got a tendency to feel more legitimate, to take the drive to achieve this change. I am right, or would you phrase it differently? So receiving social support really empowers both men and women to take more action with respect to developing societal change. And uh, Winji, I, I think you had some stories to also share with us yeah. about how you see these processes unfolding in your work. Yeah. So Winji, maybe first, could you introduce who you are and what is the initiative, the Cartier Women Initiative that you are carrying and representing today? Sure. Thank you, Celine, and thank you, Zoe. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, the Cartier Women Initiative is an international global entrepreneurship program that specifically support women impact entrepreneurs. We have been around for about 15 years, and our mission is um, for the, all of the women entrepreneurs in the world to realize their full potential. And we do this by providing social, human, and financial capital support. And so I uh, could not agree with you more, Zoe, around you know, your uh, areas of coverage around social capital support. And it's definitely uh, something that we provide to a lot of entrepreneurs uh, within our program. Um, a, a very moving story, if you will, is, is that you know, in our, in our program, um, just actually um, recently, I learned that there was a partnership that was uh, between uh, a, a fellow, Stephanie Benedetto of uh, Queen of War, that was formed with uh, Benita Singh, a fellow from 10 years ago, so t a 10 edition ago of the Cartier Women Initiative, around um, leveraging uh, Stephanie's platform for her impact business. And so it was just incredible to, to know that, you know, our network and our, the social capital that we were building amongst women impact entrepreneurs can benefit and support each other uh, to further the social change that they were trying to create. So that's very impressive to see that. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering why uh, a brand such as Cartier is investing uh, into supporting women impact entrepreneurs. What is the reason for that? Sure, yeah. Well, uh, women impact entrepreneurs are, are really remarkable. I think women impact, uh, women entrepreneurs in general, um, you know, there's a study by the Boston Consulting Group that shows that actually if you close the gender gap in um, uh, gen uh, in entrepreneurship, that you would create a global GDP of uh, 2.5 trillion. 
and that is uh, roughly equivalent to the GDP of France. And, um, and for us, we also know from the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor uh, research that women are much more driven um, to start businesses to create change. And their motivation is much more around um, solving social and environmental challenges. And we see this in our program. Our top three UN SDG goals that's solved by the fellows within our Cartier Women Initiative includes um, education, healthcare, and gender equality. And so um, we feel that uh, by putting our support behind women impact entrepreneurs, we are really mobilizing a force that is um, previously potentially uh, undervalued, excluded, um, that could be very effective in creating um, and solving the world's to-do list. And, and we have a very big to-do list as, as, as change now um, tells us. <laughs> so for audience that are listening to us, um, Zoe, what would be the advice that you would give to the audience to enable women to drive change and to enable the society to be more equal so that everyone can contribute for the sake um, of the humanity? <laughs> Thank you for asking, Celine. So first and foremost, we want to make sure that everyone is receiving the support that they need in terms of education and um, skill and knowledge attainment, and also the financial and um, social resources that they need to be able to, um, to do their best. And so my call to action is for all of us to support each other more. Um, it helps all of us to be the best versions of ourselves for our individual and organizational success, and also for those broader societal benefits that we are here to um, enrich and celebrate today. Thank you. And uh, I would ask you as well uh, the same questions for the people and the audience listening to us. If they are interested by the Cartier Women Initiative, how can you apply? Can you apply from all over the world? Would you have tips or advices to give to the women that would be interested in benefiting in the support that you are providing? Sure, yeah, I would, uh, so our next call for application is the summer of uh, next year. And so um, the best way is to follow us either on one of our social media accounts or on CartierWomenInitiative.com. We have a great community newsletter that you can sign up for where we sort of share with you all the updates of our program. And um, from now until uh, the next call for application, we often run different workshop around different resources that entrepreneurs can benefit from. So um, certainly follow us uh, and join some of the workshops to learn more about uh, different skill set that, you know, that might be supportive of your work in entrepreneurship um, and yeah and so and, and also I guess my um, uh, to all the women impact entrepreneurs out there who, who are sort of sees this uh, program and is interested in the Cartier Women Initiative please apply you know a lot of times we hear from women who thinks like oh this is you know such a great program but it's probably for a business bigger than mine or be creating greater change and um, I just want to assure you that we're looking for you so uh, please apply and join us. So thank you very much. It's very interesting because if we want to wrap up the discussions on maybe um, analyze the key elements that enable women to drive the change and to be empowered to, to drive this change, it's coming from a support and a network of support. And we can see in what you say that it's not only about women supporting women, it's about the community, the men, the women, being behind on giving all the emotional um, leg legitimacy to act and to drive the change. And I think what is coming um, as an output from the program that you're running for more than 15 years is that it's not only the coaching that is important, it's not only the money, but it's as well um, the network that is built with the different fellows that are part of, um, of the Cartier Women Initiative. I think that you told me when we were preparing these discussions that there won't be any award this year because there will be a special event that would be dedicated to the community. Could you talk a bit about that? Yes, yeah, so uh, so we are uh, 15 years old, so which are, we're very excited about, and now we have about um, uh, 200 women impact entrepreneurs as part of our fellowship, and so this year we decided to take a year uh, off, if you will, in terms of uh, running a new program, but to reunite really um, the women entrepreneurs who has been part of our program, and also all the supporters, men and women, of these women entrepreneurs, and so uh, we're hoping to have a reunion that will um, enable everyone to sort of catch up with each other, think about the impact, and, and sort of reimagine and think more about the future of what the Cartier Women Initiative could be about. 
And Zoe, maybe before we close uh, the session, I would like to ask you a question. Is there, is there any research or reports that we could read that are coming from your research or from the um, INSEAD uh, gender initiative uh, research that we could uh, have a look at if we want to have a better understanding on how to um, create the good conditions for women to take their um, chance and to um, act for change? Absolutely. Our INSEA Gender Initiative website has many resources. We have um, research write-ups, we have videos, we have many resources. So everyone is welcome to um, come and join us and explore more. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Um, so we're seeing that finance, education, network are key elements to enable women to drive uh, the change. That's one point that you and women, uh, we really uh, as well valued. Uh, we will be launching uh, this year uh, the global E4C alliances, and we will be as well launching uh, the call for actions for French uh, entrepreneurs uh, to uh, challenge uh, the men and women equality and to take the lead on this topic. So uh, we will welcome um, any uh, CEOs, any um, person from the civil society that is uh, um, that want to be involved in making equality possible. It's not only a question of women, it's a question of the society together working on it and everyone giving support so that everyone can find his way in driving this change, in driving the inspiration. So it's been a, an honor to be with two women. And I have to say that if we look at statistics, there are very few women that are researchers. So I would like to uh, thank you for, for what you do, especially for women, but as a woman uh, in, a, I would say, um, an area that is more male driven. And thank you very much um, uh, as well, Winji, for sharing all your insights. We will give um, uh, the floor to the next uh, sessions. Florence Besson from Elle, uh, from Elle magazine will come and uh, introduce you to uh, the new subject of our panel. P please stay tuned and thank you very much for um, your uh, time spent with us. Hello, my name is Florence Besson. I'm editor-in-chief at Elle French Magazine, and I'm very honored and happy uh, to be hosting this conference today on women empowerment, more recognition for more impact. We will be addressing this topic with three amazing speakers. Thank you all for being there. Uh, Lavina Sekeha, ambassador of human and peace rights. Lavina is joining us from New Delhi. Uh, she has co-founded Soil of India, a women-led income generating program which helps 600 women throughout India who are involved with a traditional art craft. We will be also speaking with Shabana Bazij-Wazik. Shabana is from Kabul, but she's now currently in the United States. She has co-founded SOLA, a school of leadership in Afghanistan, which provides access to quality education for 100 girls. And Julien Pelot, in New York right now, who is head of executive UN Women. Firstly, I think it is very important to address a few words about the situation of women right now who have suffered so much as the result of the pandemic and so much being resting on their shoulders from the children's education to the health systems. We've seen their rights going backwards throughout the world. Why is it so important to fight against that situation and empower women? Well, of course, because it makes no sense to let half of the humanity down, but also because the role they play in environmental issues is phenomenal. The IPCC has recommended to empower women to fight climate change because it's them who are on the front line. They are the one taking care of water, they are the one nourishing the children, and if they had access to more land ownership, they could feed more people by 20%. 
they are also more keen on learning new ways of farming. And uh, a 2015 study from McKinney and Kofferson showed that countries with women in governance have a better climatic track than others. Furthermore, the World Bank recommends to help them first because they are more community-minded and therefore have an effect on a wider community. And that is just what our speakers are doing. Um, so, okay, so we're waiting for Lavina. Uh, so firstly, um, I, I would like to talk about how to empower women. So Shabana Bazish Wazik, thank you very much for being with us. You had the courage in 2012 to launch a school for girls in Kabul, Afghanistan, where girls going to school are very much in danger, as we all know. Yourself, as a child, you had to dress like a boy, and you told me that you felt like a criminal when going to school, uh, which is so, I mean, very interesting to hear. Um, so can you tell us more a, a bit about this feeling and, uh, and what convinced you that you had to create a school for other girls? Uh, thank you so much, Florence, for having me. Uh, I have to clarify that um, what I really meant was that the system was criminal. Um, I, I say this very emphatically, that any, any regime, any system that criminalizes girls' education is one that I do not support or, uh, in fact, very strongly stand in opposition of. Um, and precisely, um, some of the very powerful statistics that you just uh, cited, um, it's very uh, clear that when girls and women are given an opportunity um, to participate fully in any sector, uh, whether that is in education or addressing the climate crisis or um, uh, equalizing land ownership, um, everyone benefits uh, from that. Uh, not just girls and women, uh, but everyone in our in, in a society. Um, and that's precisely why um, I set out to uh, establish um, my country's first and unfortunately still only all girls boarding school. Um, with the idea that uh, girls in Afghanistan will have access to quality education um, so that then they can go on um, to um, their home provinces and exactly do uh, what you just cited, whatever, whether they want to join the public sector or private sector, and whatever sector they decide to work in, that they will have the education and the skill sets necessary to be able to uh, make significant changes. Um, we established it as a boarding school um, precisely to be able to bring in girls uh, from all parts of Afghanistan. Uh, currently, our 100 students represent uh, 28 of the 34 provinces uh, across Afghanistan, and that's quite significant. What that means is that these girls go home to um, villages and often districts where other girls in their villages don't go to school. Uh, and they're really not only a beacon of hope, but really... A, change makers already uh, during their short or long breaks, um, really focusing on educating other girls in their home and in their neighborhood and in their village. Yes, but you, what convinced you? What, I mean, everybody thinks the same way as you, but not everyone goes, you know, into action. So that's the appeal we're doing right now. Yeah, there are a couple of, there were a few experiences for me. One, uh, if I can go through it very, very briefly, one was, uh, Obviously, my own childhood, growing up under the Taliban regime, having to dress up as a boy, go to a secret school in someone's house, and only after 9-11, at age 12, realizing that that was quite unfair. Um, then, uh, it, at age 15, I came to the United States as a high school exchange student, and for the first time in my life, I had this experience of what it meant for young girls in a society not to worry about their their education mm. in a way they what it what it felt like for girls not to have this looming threat over their heads that their education could be taken away from them at any time or that they may not go to school anymore so they the fact that girls didn't have to live with that worry um, it was a beautiful experience for me. I was really inspired by that. And I knew even at that age, at a young age, um, that when Afghanistan gets to a place um, where girls in Afghanistan can take their education for granted and not have to feel any special just because they're receiving an education, 
that the progress in Afghanistan will get to a place where it cannot be reversed. And then finally, I think um, what really got me to um, uh, kind of take action was um, after my freshman year of my undergraduate uh, degree in the United States in 2007, I, um, you know, I've learned that um, only 6% of women in Afghanistan have a college degree. Mm -hmm. Um, and that statistic was quite powerful. It was uh, shocking for me. I was uh, attending one of the best undergraduate institutions in the United States and by extension the world. And I felt extremely privileged and lucky, but also really um, guilty. Mm -hmm. And I needed to channel it in a place where I could be most effective. So when I thought about uh, whether I wanted to become a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, uh, when I thought very deeply about any of these, um, at the end of the day, I wasn't satisfied. I didn't, um, I didn't feel that I could do enough. And what really convinced me was to become an educator, to create space for young girls where they yes. could um, access quality education so that they can then go on to pursue whatever dreams they have, whether they want to become doctors, you. engineers, um, yes. you know, explorers, and have the impact. Uh, in their communities. Thank you very much. And Lavina, thank you uh, for being with us. Uh, you yourself have created in India the world's largest sustainable life st lifestyle store. You travel for five years uh, to find the best artisans and the best way to help women in rural communities. Uh, you say that women who lack education uh, yet have a very strong traditional knowledge of, uh, uh, and, and you, you put light on that, and you say that uh, they have a fierce force emerging from them as soon as they get a sense of this, of this power. Can you tell us about that? So firstly, thank you, Florence, Shobana, and Julian. It's so inspiring to meet you all here on the planet, uh, on this panel, you know, on this panel. Thank you. I'm, I'm really awestruck and delighted of what Change Now is doing at this point in time, you know, into creating momentum across the world. And only when, you know, only through serious collaboration that any impactful change can take place. So, uh, to begin with, Soil was started with an intention to promote rural artisans who handcraft natural produce, you know, from their very homes, but are unable to share it with the world. India itself has about 100 million artisans, of which 70% are women. Now, these women are the backbone of their families, of their homes, of their communities. And because they earn less than $5, 5 US dollars a day, they remain totally marginalized. Mm -hmm. And they are unable to do anything for themselves, leave aside their community. And though 90% of these women artisans are uneducated, they remain highly skilled at handlooms and handicrafts. So while education is significant, but in this case, providing them a steady income so they can provide food on their plate for their families is most crucial. And I have seen this change and how it drives them, you know, to help other women in their communities to, to join in towards uplifting. Thank you so much. Julien Pelot, we, we have seen that the situation for women has worsened during the, the COVID-19. You told me about a shadow pandemic. Yes, well, thank you so much for, for having me here today as well. And, uh, and, and, uh, and I'm so uh, impressed and, uh, and, and blown away by, by the example that we have just heard of change, of very concrete change uh, from uh, Shavana and, uh, and Lavina. And, uh, and yes, in the last year in the COVID pandemic, uh, unfortunately, we have seen that women have been disproportionately affected at, on multiple levels. The, the shadow pandemic that we as UN Women have talked about is the shadow pandemic of violence, uh, where, you know, with the lockdowns that we have seen around the world and that are still going on in many countries around the world, um, women have been locked down with uh, their uh, perpetrator uh, very often and with very few ways of actually uh, getting support. Uh, we have estimates that approximately 243 million women and girls between the age of 15 and 49 have experienced violence last year. And in some countries, that's an increase of um, about 40 percent or even more. So it's a quite significant issue and one that is not uh, sufficiently talked about. But the, the pandemic has also had an effect on women's economic participation. Uh, we uh, at the UN estimate that 47 million women will be pushed into extreme poverty 
uh, by COVID-19 in 2021 alone. So that's, uh, that's the whole population of Spain, just to give you a, a sense. Uh, and often that's due because of the additional unpaid care work that these women had to undertake. Uh, child care, caring for the sick, for the elderly. This often uh, falls back on women and, um, and, and, and without the adequate support from the governments, uh, from uh, you know, various uh, community structures, uh, uh, women unfortunately have to give up their jobs to be able to continue to manage households. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's something that we as young women are trying to address. We're trying to, to ask governments to take measures that are more responsive uh, to, to gender differences and, uh, and, and to not be blind in their response to the pandemic to the very particular issues that women and girls are facing uh, today. Thank you. Lavina, you, you, Julia is talking about the violence and the extreme poverty women are, are, are pushed into. You told me earlier that every time that you help a woman, you have a whole community, so the impact is not only for them, it's for the whole village, as you just said. Can you tell us more about this? Sure. So this is really true. It has been my experience at Soil of India, and even the humanitarian initiatives I have worked on so far, which involve women and children at grassroots levels in India across 70,000 villages, that when you empower a woman to earn a living wage, she becomes an unstoppable force. Mm -hmm. of light and inspiration for the entire community, for her children, she becomes an example. And through that, you know, she transforms and changes everything. So whether it's the health, whether it's the health of a family, whether it's the health of a community, hygiene, or even social and environmental form within her community and the village. So here in Soil, she's handcrafting products from her own home. There is no dependence on anyone. She does not need to go to a factory. She does not need to get exploited. She gets paid without any negotiation from soil. Soil does not negotiate with, with, with artisans or any of the pricing. Mm -hmm. There are no middlemen involved, so there is no exploitation. And, you know, she gains stability of income. So this is the trigger that has led us to identify and work with such women, and it really works. Yes, La Lavina, I guess you have the same feeling and you, you said that uh, in Afghanistan the, the most determined voices for democracy are women voices. Yeah, I, I absolutely echo what Lavina just mentioned. Um, you know, I see it even in the education sector when, when you uh, invest in one girl um, in, in her education, that automatically translates in education for a lot of people. I mean, first, for you know, the generations after coming after her will always be educated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm a living example of that. My my mother was the first woman in her family to receive an education, and when she found herself living under the Taliban regime that criminalized girls' education, um, raising daughters, um, she couldn't um, you know undo all the progress that her family made um, when educating her. So for her, the greater risk. Was was uh, raising us without an education as opposed to risking our lives and her life. Um, I see that over and over with our students uh, when they go home um, for short breaks or even longer breaks. What happens is they go to the, they, uh, within their homes, they start uh, tutoring um, uh, other family members or they tutor girls in their community. In some cases, you may have heard of, for instance, Helmand Province. We have a whole number of girls coming from Helmand province, and when they go home for uh, extended holidays, um, they go to the local public school and volunteer to teach. And the local public school where they volunteer to teach, they only have four female teachers. Mm -hmm. And now, when they go there, they more than double the number of female teachers uh, in the community, and that already gets out um, and more girls are inspired. Um, coming back to the current situation, um, today, um, if you look at all the um, the, the current uh, political instability in Afghanistan and uh, the peace negotiation processes, not just one process, but processes, um, actually, even within um, Afghanistan, women's voices, there is a beautiful diversity between urban and rural women. But when there is one place where they have presented a strong, unified front, and that is um, the kind of uh, peace that is uh, that is uh, durable and one that will work for every single person living in Afghanistan, whether they come from cities or urban areas, whether they're Pashtuns mm -hmm. or Tajiks or Uzbek or Hazaras and the different yeah. uh, ethnic and linguistic uh, minority groups. And that's Thank quite you. inspiring. Um, yes. 
Yeah. Re really, yeah. And and Shina, because I, I want to to hear about that. Hearing you, you you're so amazing. You, you, it makes us think: How can an institution like you and women can scale up those programs and make them worldwide? Do do you think we should, I don't know, change our tax policies, or public policies, or what? What do you recommend? Yeah, no, I think, you know, the, this, these are great, uh, great initiatives, of course, and, and I couldn't agree more with the, the significant impact that even one woman or one girl can have on her community and her whole nation. Um, and, and, you know, for us with UN Women, I mean, we are a fairly small United Nations entity compared to others. Uh, but uh, our strength comes in our partnerships. We work very closely with civil society. We're one of the few UN agencies that has an explicit mandate to work with civil society. And then we work with governments. And, and, and here, really, I want to emphasize that governments have a responsibility to uh, meet their obligations under the Convention of the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Most governments have also signed on to the Beijing Platform for Action. These are international documents where it's spelled out very clearly what they're supposed to do. So uh, governments can, should be providing the financing to scale up this kind of initiatives that we're hearing about so that they have a greater impact. We know that they work and they need to be replicated, they need to be financed, they need to be brought at a completely different scale. But for that, there are two things that I want to, to highlight uh, briefly. First is the importance of women's participation and leadership at all levels of decision making. And so, you know, for example, we were talking about COVID before. Uh, we have done an analysis of all the COVID uh, uh, response task force around the world. And the reality is that you, you have uh, a, the, a vast majority of, of uh, COVID task force which have no participation from women at all. Mm -hmm. So how can you, uh, you know, decide what is the right thing to do in responding to COVID if you are excluding half of the world's population from the solutions you're trying to identify? Yes. So women's participation and leadership is extremely important. And the second point that I want to, to highlight is the importance of working with men and boys to transform gender stereotypes and social norms that perpetuate the systemic inequalities that we see and the attitudes and the behaviors that continue to push women into certain roles, these stereotypes are harming for women, but they're also harming for men. They prevent them also from having the full opportunity because they also get boxed. You know, and so it, Celine yeah. was talking uh, earlier about the HIP or she initiative. I just mm -hmm. want to mention, mention that. And, and that's, for example, one initiative that we have at UN Women to try and transform uh, men and boys and bring them as allies and to be more accountable to women and girls and to gender equality. Yes, you said Emma Goldman, you know, said uh, we have to uh, free half of humanity so we can free the other half. So yeah, that's exactly, exactly what you just said. Uh, we only have two minutes left. I'm so sorry. I want to ask you all a couple of words to, to conclude with and, and uh, because you told me about hope. All of you told me about hope uh, thanks to the Internet, thanks to civil society. So uh, please, I don't know, Lavina, if you want to start. Well, uh, I would like to say that uh, in India, we, you know, we, there is no specific government system, you know, to to support artisans of India. We have state handicraft emporiums. We have central ha centralized handicraft emporiums. But the products that are lying here are just like subsidies, you know. And artisans don't need subsidies. Artisans need economic independence. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, so that is where we are because the government is somehow not recognizing that, you know, these artisans are holding the thread, you know, of biodiversity or being completely aligned with nature. So here is that I want to just say that, you know, it, in fact, Handmade India with 100 million artisans is perhaps the single largest producer of sustainable lifestyle goods yes. in the world. And if escalated as envisioned by soil, it fulfills all the five key UN SDGs. Mm -hmm. Decent work and economic growth for the artisan community. Responsible consumption and production by being completely aligned to nature. Good health and well-being because we're using all natural produce for conscious consumers. Uh, you know, vegetable dyes, vegetable extracts, root, plants, botanical herbs. Reduce inequality by empowering women and climate action because all our products are eco-friendly, biodegradable, and they're all in sync with the planet. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Shabana, in a very few words, I'm very sorry, we really don't have a lot of time. Sure. 
Um, look, uh, you will hear all sorts of reporting uh, on Afghanistan today. It sounds um, quite scary when you uh, follow the news. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my request and my advice from everyone listening, especially people who care about girls' education and women's rights, is that we Afghan women and girls have not given up, and I hope you don't give up. You don't, you don't accept the resignation already of return to dark times, because we, under no circumstances, will return to that. So uh, remain an ally, uh, be a strong advocate. Um, even if, if nothing else, go back to the words of the girls whose school was attacked on May 8th. Uh, from the hospital bed, they said they will return to school as soon as possible. Even if they're attacked again, they will go back to school, because they will simply not stop getting an education getting knowledge. So if they're not stopping, you should, under no circumstances, give up on Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Julien, do you have a, a, a small word? Yes, one last word. You know, this conference is about change and about change now. And I really believe that the gender equality, uh, you know, work that we're doing, all of us here today, is the most transformative change that you can do. So I really encourage everybody to become an ally and a partner in this work. We will have a big forum in Paris at the end of June, the Generation Equality Forum, which mm -hmm. is about that. And we'll have much more time to talk about it in detail. So everybody's invited. Please come. Please join us. It will be virtual as well. And that will be about very concrete change. Thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, so thank you all for having listened to us. And I leave you now with Christine Zwarer. Thank you. Merci. I am Christine Slara. I'm a director of Women's Empowerment at BSR, and it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, really exciting from the, from the last session where we heard that um, in, investing in one girl really creates a ripple effect. So we're going to talk more about investments, and we're going to focus on women entrepreneurs' access to investment. And this is really important because in the U.S. alone, only 3% of venture capital goes to women entrepreneurs, yet the number of female-headed enterprises keeps on rising. And, and from the work I do we're in emerging markets, we hear that less than one in five women entrepreneurs feel that they are able to invest, to access investment and loans from any, anything other than a circle of family and friends. So we're going to get really practical here and hear uh, about a couple of examples of change that my panelists um, are involved in, in doing practical ways of levelling the playing field for, for women entrepreneurs. So first you're going to hear from Yumiko Murakami, who is OECD's um, head of their Tokyo Centre. And then I'm going to have, um, Yumiko is joining us from a video, and then I am going to be talking to Kamal Hassan, who is a managing partner at um, Loyal VC. But let's move over to Yumiko first. Hello, my name is Yumiko Murakami, and I am the head of the OECD Tokyo Center. I'm honored to be part of this very important session to discuss gender equality uh, in a financial industry, in particular in the VC um, space. I have been with the OECD for the last eight years, and in this capacity, I have been uh, involved in a number of policy discussions around gender diversity. And before I joined OECD eight years ago, I spent almost 20 years in finance, mostly with Goldman Sachs uh, in New York. And I have been back uh, in Japan, my home country, for about 10 years now. And I must say it's been very interesting to see how uh, certain things have changed and at the same time, uh, others have not changed at all when it comes to gender diversity. And unfortunately, gender diversity in the VC industry has not changed all that much in uh, recent years. And this is true in almost all countries around the world, but in particular uh, in Japan, the situation is, to be frank, pretty bad. 
So in this context, um, I would like to talk about the role of international institutions such as OECD and other government organizations and also uh, global institutions in the private sector. One of the most important and impactful things that international institutions can do or should do, in my opinion, is to make it easier for investors to measure what's happening and what's not happening uh, in the gender diversity department at, in, at any given company. And as much as people love to talk about ESG and ESG investment these days, the truth is there is really no globally accepted uh, standard uh, when it comes to uh, ESG. Um, but I would say the good news is there is a, a quite a bit of a momentum right now to establish universal measurements. And even though much of the current discussion has been centered around E and G, I do believe there is increasing awareness that S elements, including gender, are you know, equally important um, you know, versus E and G uh, when it comes to implications uh, to the financial performance of companies. So this uh, is where international institutions and both public and um, private sectors should collaborate uh, and develop standard measurements um, so that people can really you know, measure where things are. You know, at the end of the day, um, if you don't know where the needle stands, you can't move the needle. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's, that's, in my opinion, uh, very, very important. Um, and this movement um, in terms of coming up with this, uh, some sort of um, uh, global standard, you know, it obviously has started with large uh, listed companies, but institutional investors are increasingly active uh, in the private markets these days, and they are likely to use um, similar, if not the, the same, measurements to assess ventures. And whether investors believe diversity can enhance their financial returns or not, you know, at the end of the day, it depends on each investor. And so I would say, let markets decide. But having a framework to measure uh, ESG um, elements, including diversity, gender diversity, you know, or, you know, other diversity, um, can certainly help uh, those investors who believe it is material information um, to assess companies' fundamentals. Um, so if, uh, you know, if NASDAQ is prohibiting companies uh, with no minority directors from being listed, you know, what does that mean to ventures? Go figure, right? So I think this is all happening. It's a very uh, good, uh, positive um, direction. Now, the second uh, topic of my intervention uh, is female leadership style. And of course, uh, there are gender-based characteristics in both male and female leadership styles. And I don't think it is a question of which one is better than the other. But in the face of COVID crisis, there have been um, a very successful female leaders who seem to handle the crisis very well. And some of the common characteristics that have been observed um, in them um, are data-driven, uh, decisiveness, uh, communication, and empathy. But in my opinion, for both male and female leaders, one of the most critical uh, elements is, is the um, ability to listen to various views and opinions and the ability to establish the decision-making process that reflects different viewpoints. And I do think this applies to the VC industry as well. And you know, if you look at the VC um, industry, you know, almost all capitalists are male and it is very easy for them to miss opportunities and overlook um, the risks. So something to bear in mind, I think it's really important to, to really understand the benefit of having you know, a bunch of different viewpoints um, melting you know, in, in, in this you know, pot or discussion uh, table. So uh, I do think it's something that we all have to think about. Um, and on that note, um, I'd like to share some exciting news, uh, which is uh, I am going to uh, launch um, uh, Japan's first ESG-focused VC 
uh, that's led by female founders, uh, myself included. Uh, there are three of us, uh, three women. Um, who actually have been in financial industry for a long time, 20 years plus, uh, who are going to launch uh, this um, uh, venture capital fund. And hopefully we can make a difference uh, to very much homogeneous uh, BC industry right now. Um, hopefully there'll be more uh, funds like uh, ours going forward. And with that, I'd like to uh, finish my comments and hopefully uh, you would have a, um, a really interesting uh, discussion um, from here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yumiko, and I guess from all of us, a big congratulations on your new venture and best of luck. Um, welcome, Kamal. Um, let me start by some of the things that Yumiko was saying. Um, you heard her talk about, I guess, uh, mainly the importance of, of having women in leadership when investment decisions um, are being made and, and that leading to a different different thinking around risk mitigation. In your view, how important when we think about creating an investment environment that benefits female entrepreneurs, do you see female leadership as being? So I believe more women investors is a good goal in itself. The science is clear that diverse teams make better decisions. If your goal is funding more women entrepreneurs and more women investors isn't enough. Uh, there was a recent report in the US that said that 23% of VC investment professionals are women and 16% of VC partners, yet still there's only 3% of dollars going to companies with a woman CEO. Um, so I mean, if you look at the data, hiring more women VCs on its own doesn't seem to be moving the needle. And I think we need to focus on both as independent goals, not assume that one is going to the other. Thanks. And actually, let's so let's think about ways that you yourself have worked to move the needle at at um, in in your VC in your company. You've identified one particular barrier that you see is 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 a real um, constraint to create an equal playing field for male and female uh, between male and female entrepreneurs. Tell us a bit about what it is that you've done. Sure. So. As background, I was an entrepreneur for 20 years before I launched Loyal VC. And as an entrepreneur, when you look at other entrepreneurs, you soon conclude that VCs fund the ones that perform best on stage, not necessarily the ones that perform best at running their business. So that led us to question the standard VC process, and we decided to use a process that starts with small pilot investments. We do what any smart corporate does in working with a startup. We pilot first. So if you compare that to the standard funding process, it looks like exactly what you see on TV shows like Shark, Sh Shark Tank and Dragon's Den, where you've got this stream of supplicant entrepreneurs who are pitching themselves to investors who are graciously dispensing money. And our motivation was to change the, the process. We wanted to treat entrepreneurs as we want to be treated. Fundamentally, is we wanted to make money. I don't think of myself as a gender warrior. We did, however, get curious. And we said, okay, well, why is it that only 3% of VC dollars are going to companies with a woman CEO? And we didn't find any evidence that women underperform in running businesses, but there's very strong evidence that men have an advantage when it comes to pitching. The most famous study out of Harvard found that when they used actors to pitch the same business with the same script, that both male and female audience members were more likely to want to fund a business when it was pitched by a good-looking man and least likely to, pitch, uh, to, to fund a business when it was pitched by a good-looking woman. And let me stress, women investors had the same bias as male investors. So, I mean, if you think about it as an investor, why should we be using a process that we know picks the best looking men and doesn't pick the best investments. Where's the profit in that? So after you, um, I love this idea of picking the best looking men as being the kind of the key indicator. And, and, and we, um, you know, you, we could spoke a little bit about the need for measurements. Um, I'm not sure that is what you measure, but um, after you, Remove the pitch um, so that um, so that everyone has an e equal opportunity to be getting the investment. Can you talk us a little bit about the measurable change you have seen as a result? Sure. And by the way, Yumiko is exactly right. If you look at our fund, 30% of our portfolio companies are women CEOs, which is about around the ratio you see in engineering programs, MBA alumni.
by accelerator programs. It's just an indicator of the population we draw from. Um, it isn't just us. If you look at other VCs who fund primarily or solely based on the data, as Yumiko is saying, you see similar numbers, which is around 30% of the companies they fund have women CEOs. Now, that's not 50%, but it's 10 times better than the industry average, and I think a replica of where the money is to be made. How do you get to the 50%? Do you, you need to address the, uh, the the feeder programs we pull from. So you need to address accelerator programs. You need to ex address engineering programs. You need to address MBA programs. MBA programs are getting much closer to the 50%. However, if you look at the alumni who are five and 10 years out, who are the sort of people we fund, it takes time for change to move through the system. So if removing the pitch improves things by 10 times, as, as, as you were talking about, how come everyone else are not doing that? How, how are you going to make the case for all other investors to, to, to be looking at removing this particular barrier as well? Well, it's interesting. Venture capitalists have a fiduciary duty to their investors, their limited partners, to invest in the best possible companies. Now, they will use this as an excuse to not set targets for investing in women CEOs, but only to set targets for hiring women team members. If you look at the data, though, I mean, do you honestly believe as a VC, can you say that you found the best possible entrepreneurs if 97% of your portfolio CEOs are men? I mean, how much money are you leaving on the table? And my advice to my fellow VCs, who I know, by the way, are honestly trying to find more women entrepreneurs to invest in, is that you have to look at this as a profit-critical problem. Your underrepresentation of women in your portfolio is a symptom of bad decisions leading to a threat to your returns. So what I'd say is if you think of it as profit critical, well, you're going to start measuring gender and questioning every step in your process. And if a certain step, like I would argue the pitch process, causes a big drop in the percentage of women funded, then you have to look at that step and figure out how to replace it because it'll make you more money if you do. So a clear business case that you just need to convince others of. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's obviously not the only thing. And, and, and you talked about feeder pipeline and thinking about, and it, it brought me back to thinking about what we just heard before about starting all the way from, from educating girls in schools in Afghanistan and bringing it all the way through. But with, 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 um, with that particular issue around the pitch removed, what are some of the game change, the next game changes that, that you see that where you might be able to contribute or where you're looking for others um, to contribute to, to continue to improve an investment community that will enable and make a tangible difference, I guess, to um, you know, some of the amazing women-led um, projects and ideas that we've heard about today? Well, what if you talk about things? a game changer, sir? Yeah. Where do we if, go if next? If you talk about a game changer, yeah. Well, in terms of where to go next, the people with the most power in the system are the limited partners, because the limited partners, the pension plans of the world are the ones who decide which VCs get funded. And if they take action, it'll flow through the system. And I think for VCs right now, they're demanding changes in team composition. That's why you're seeing many more women VCs. But I think that they have to start focusing on who gets the money, not who allocates the money. So the simple thing is if LPs at a minimum insisted that every firm they invest in report on the percentage of women CEOs in their portfolio, set soft targets. If you want to be more challenging, limited partners can set a minimum percentage of every VC fund they invest in, say something very achievable like 15 or 20 percent that has to be invested in companies with a woman CEO. And if a VC partner doesn't want to, to commit to finding those entrepreneurs, then give your money to a VC who will. So getting the money in the hands of women entrepreneurs being one of them, um, what do companies like yours do to ensure that they achieve all the success they can possibly achieve once the money is in their hands? 
we heard about that in one of the earlier panels in this session, but about the importance of getting support. And in our case, for instance, we have over 400 advisors around the world who support our companies. And you're absolutely right. As, as a VC, it isn't just about giving people money. It's also about supporting them. As a, as a venture capitalist, you've seen hundreds of businesses go through the process. As an entrepreneur, you're working typically on your first or even your third. So there's a lot of experience which can be drawn by matching up those with experience with entrepreneurs looking to succeed. The great thing is there are many, many experienced business people who want to mentor and support women entrepreneurs. Do these advice that need different skills or support? Are there specific targets or measurement that you'd be setting for them when they support um, women entrepreneurs? We definitely have a mix of skills. And that's one of the things we do, which is unusual as a fund, is often the venture capitalists, they look at his gray hair and they think, oh my goodness, he knows everything about how to help a company. And one of the things we've realized is a lot of humility to say that whatever I think I may know about any subject, there's always a specialist who knows that subject better. So our goal is to find those specialists so that one month you want help on digital marketing, the next month you want help on the security of your business, the security of your IT system. So find those experts and connect the companies to them. That's how you can give the most help to entrepreneurs. Right. Um, so, and, and we're kind of get, getting to the end of and, and, and wrapping up of, of our session today. So, um, I've had. I just want to hear if you've got something, something additional that you wanted to add. Um, clear measurements removing the obstacles within your own system that enables for an equal playing field and then continued support um, over time. Anything else that you would say, actually, that, that is something else that we absolutely must do in this space? I would think just return to motivation because I think a lot of people's motivation is justice. And while justice is a good motivator on its own, in this case, it's not just about justice. It's about justice and profit. And too many people use profit as an excuse to not act as opposed to looking at this and to say profit is the reason to act. Thank you so much, Kamal, for that. So some very practical, um, some very practical ideas, some very practical steps that all investors, whether they're VCs or I, I, um, institutional investors, um, can take, should take, and should put, push even further. Um, I am going to leave um, this session, and we're going to hand you over to Santiago Le Lefebvre, who's the head of Change Now, um, or the founder of Change Now, and he's going to take us to our final session for today. And we are approaching the end of this session, of the Women for Change session. And before just we, we, we part our ways uh, for a next chapter uh, later, I just wanted to leave you with a, a little surprise. Uh, this morning I had the immense pleasure to interview Sylvia Earle. I asked her a question and I just want you to, 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 to keep that as a, as a closing um, uh, word from Sylvia Earle. I just wanted to know, you know, when you decided, when you started uh, to be a, an oceanographer, a scientist um, for the ocean, were there a lot of women? Well, there are plenty of female fish and dolphins and whales. You know, half the creatures in the sea are female. <laughs> Maybe half of the people eventually, who go into science or math or any other endeavor that historically has been thought of as a man's world, we are beginning to appreciate the, the importance of that the people, it is not a matter of gender, it's a matter mostly of, of will and, and of you know, everyone is different. We all have this range of, of 
possibilities, but no two people are exactly alike. And it isn't a gender, male, female thing. It's, who are you? Are you good with math? Are you good with music? Is science your passion? Do you have a way with children? Do you have a way with people? Whatever it is that, that makes you you, I, I tell children, you're, you're lucky to be around now because of the more open approach that people have to looking at, at who you are as a person in a, in a more open way. We're, we're still not where we need to be. There's still these barriers about you're too old, you're too young, you're too tall, you're too short, you're this color, you're that color, you come from this country, you come from that country, but if you have in your heart something that you really want to do, let it, let it, you know, let it go. Go that way. Don't give in to people who say you can't do that. You're a girl, or you're a boy, or you're too young, or you, you, whatever it is. Believe in yourself. And I had parents who encouraged me to do that, and perhaps that's what it kept me going. I, I felt that no matter how hard things were, they would always be there for me saying, it's okay, it's okay, we're here for you. If you can find or have someone who is, who believes in you, that helps, but mostly believe in yourself. And don't let those who tell you you can't do something get in the way. Go around them, go over them, go through them, do whatever it takes. I did not have the kind of resources that that some of my male colleagues had and, and certainly did not have the support. Otherwise, the people believe that you know, men can be leaders, men can do things naturally that it seems surprising for women to do. But in a way, when women have shown accomplishment, in some ways they stand out because it appears to be unusual. It may be condescending, but in the end, just be true to your, your heart and what it is that, that you, you really care about. And that will take you, take you far. It's, it's what has kept me going. I, I just, I could see my brothers doing things I wanted to do. I knew I could do them. So I just followed them along or they had to follow me sometimes. But knowing that, look, life is a gift. And to get others saying that you cannot do something that you really want to do, it, it, don't let them discourage your, that, that makes you special. And I just wish that everyone could see the world through the eyes of, of, of a child, thinking about what the future is going to be and how you, as an individual, can be a, a part of this limited time that we've got. What is it you really want to do with your life? What do you... Where do you want to be? And keep that vision strong. And sometimes you must do some things you don't really like to do in order to get from here to there. But keep that vision in mind about who you want to be, where you want to go. I never questioned wanting to be a scientist. I didn't know what to call it, but I knew I had to do something to, that would have me working with exploring the nature of plants and animals, life on Earth. And I discovered that most of it's out there in the ocean. And I just kept going from there. I just, one thing leads to another, to another. You keep exploring, keep moving in a direction that is special to you. Well, thank you. Thanks a lot, Celia. That's a wrap. Uh, that's a wrap, so thanks a lot for making us the privilege to be with us today. 
You know, it's a, you, you embody a lot of values we have here at Change now, and so it's a pleasure to have you with us. I hope you liked it. For me, I, it was definitely a great um, piece of thought, additional piece of thought uh, to, to wrap up this session. And just before we close, I wanted to definitely and profoundly thank uh, all our partners on this Women for Change session. I put in my notes, but I want not to, uh, to, to, to forget anyone. So thank you to Cartier Women's Initiative, to the UN Women, He for She, One, One Young World, Women's Forum, women's, uh, Women in Africa, and Elle Magazine. So thanks a lot. Uh, I think we had a wonderful time during this uh, almost one hour and a half of, of content around this crucial question of women for change. And we tell you, see you soon for the next chapter of Women for Change.